In the name of the Father, the Son, welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, it's just great to be with you. We start off our daily Perseverance Conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has many beautiful titles. We invoke Mary as the mother of God, her greatest title. Mary is also the mother of the church. And also Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. And we call out to Mary also as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's... Uh, turn to Mary and ask Mary to be with us, to pray with us and to pray for us as we pray the prayer that she loves most. That prayer is the say Hail Mary together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death Amen. Now let's turn to our spiritual guide, our spiritual director, and let's invite him to be with us. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. He has many wonderful titles, and he's known as the Paraclete. He's also known as the Gift of Gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. It's also known as our counselor. He's also known as our consoler. He's also known as our consoler. He's also known as our Interior Master, <clears throat> Interior Master. St. Paul says, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans. And we don't know how to pray as we ought, but he intercedes with ineffable groans so we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Father. Or daddy. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to be with us, to give us a lot of light. How important is that our mind be illuminated by light and that our hearts be set on fire, fire with divine love. Our hearts be set on fire with divine love. As we say, come Holy Spirit, Fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of the Rosary, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Bruno, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Francis Xavier, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, Pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. If 
In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. The family that prays together stays together. So we always start off our day by praying together. As a perseverance family, we pray to Mary, we pray to the Holy Spirit, we pray also to the angels, we pray to the saints, we pray for each other, and then to encourage all of you, I promise to pray for all of you in a very special way. And I'd like to place you on the altar in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Today's uh, Oblates, we'll, we will start to have a con-celebrated Mass every Thursday among the Oblate priests. So I'll place you on the altar with your intentions. Of course, you know that there's no greater prayer. There's no greater prayer in the world than the prayer which is the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is the prayer par excellence. So, I'd like to play, pray at first that all of you would, uh, as well as myself, we would be open to the Holy Spirit that we would be docile, receptive to the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You might during the course of the day pray this short aspiration and that prayer is come Holy Spirit come. Come Holy Spirit come through the heart of Mary. Come Holy Spirit come Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Then, I'd like to pray for, for all of us who are called to be teachers. We as priests were called to pray and to preach. Those are two of the essential elements of living out our priesthood, to pray to pray for you, to pray to God for the conversion of sin, to pray, but also to preach the Word of God. St. Paul will go on to say, Woe to me if I do not preach the Word of God, because faith comes through hearing. But also you as parents, that, we would, that you would preach the Word of God by your words, but also by your example of life having in mind the salvation of your family, the salvation of your children is of utmost importance. My third intention will be to place on the altar the petition of the conversion of sinners. That's right. The petition of the conversion of sinners. Especially to pray for the conversion of deathbed sinners. When I say deathbed sinners, uh, deathbed sinners, especially those who will die especially those who will die today and those who are dying today, not close to God, those who are possibly immersed in serious sin, that our prayers will move them to say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son, living God, have mercy in me. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I love you. That they will be moved by those interior sentiments and be saved. The Lord came not to condemn but to save and gave his life in ransom for many. So let's pray in our prayers in the Mass for the conversion of sinners, especially for the conversion of deathbed sinners. So there we have our prayer intentions, my friends. 
So October is the month of the Rosary. And actually tomorrow is the feast day of the Holy Rosary. So encourage all of you to pray the Most Holy Rosary. Pray it fervently, frequently, filled with faith. Because the family that prays together stays together. And a world at prayer is a world at peace. So yesterday, my friends, we we celebrated the memorial of St. Faustina Maria Kowalska. I encourage all of you to do three things to live out the doctrine that God taught through this great saint. I encourage all of you to, to um, read the diary. To read and meditate upon the diary of St. Faustina. It's a modern spiritual classic, and I believe anyone who gets that text in his or her hands starts to read, will get into, will, will fall in love with Christ. It's such a wonderful text that, that leads us naturally to prayer. And what is prayer? Prayer is talking to God. And once again, yesterday we had the Our Father, and today is an extension of the theme of the Our Father, where Jesus talks about the importance of prayer. Insisting upon perseverance. We have to persevere and never give up prayer. What air is to the lungs, so prayer is to our soul. We don't breathe, we're going to die. People die of coronavirus because they can't breathe. People die spiritually because they give up prayer. What air is to the lungs, prayer is to our souls. We never give up prayer. Never. Never give up prayer. And I said related to Faustina to also to pray the chaplet of divine mercy. Many people have the mistaken notion that they can only pray the chaplet of divine mercy at 3 p.m. That is the mercy hour. An hour, a moment of grace, no doubt about it. But there's no reason why we cannot pray the Chapa Divine Mercy any time during the course of the day. Actually, you know, you can pray the Chapa in five, six, seven minutes. When you're in your car for five minutes, you can pray it. You're taking a walk, pray, pray it. When you're on the grocery line, you got five minutes to wait, pray it. But I would add to it, when you are praying it, Pray for those who are dying at that moment. What I'm trying to insist upon in our conversations, my friends, is we want to try to bring as many people to heaven as possible. Amen? Yeah. We want to try to bring as many, many people to heaven as possible. As avaricious misers, Ebenezer Scrooges, are ambitious for money, we should be ambitious for the salvation of souls. Amen. Amen, brother and sister. We should be ambitious, hungry, to fill the grain barns of heaven with as many souls as possible. Let's work together to do that. Of course, inviting Mary and St. Joseph and the angels and saints to help us in this most noble enterprise of working for the salvation of of immortal souls. So, today, I like to um, cover a lot in a relatively short time. First, I'd like to just talk briefly about the saint that we celebrate today. His name is Saint Bruno. He was born around 1030 and died in 1101 on October 6. St. Bruno was, was born in Cologne, which would be uh, Germany. Had a brilliant mind. He was a theology professor for about 17 years, but that was not his desire. 
even though he was a great teacher. He wanted to live, he wanted to live a life of solitude and contemplation and prayer. So he, um, with a group of six men who had the same ideal, they went off to a place called Chartreuse. And someone had a vision of these seven shining stars in the firmament of heaven. And that was Bruno and the other six followers. So they wanted to live a, a life of total silence, prayer, and penance. So St. Bruno was instrumental in establishing what is called the Carthusian lifestyle. Carthusian lifestyle in which a little, there's eventually a little, a little uh, house or hermitage was built for each one, which would be three rooms, and they'd, live in, they'd be living all by themselves. And they would, an oratory was built in which they could come together morning and evening to pray together. But aside from that, the rest of their day would be dedicated to prayer and penance and study and reading and reflection. That was the contribution of St. Bruno to the church. And that is a pure contemplative a purely contemplative lifestyle. Now that's not for you and it's not for me either. But those who are called to this lifestyle are very few, but it's a very sublime vocation where they want to dedicate their whole life to silence and prayer and contemplation and studying and practicing penance. So let's pray that at least to a limited degree, like St. Bruno, that we would have a real hunger for the contemplative life. And that means for us, a real hunger for the contemplative life would be to be faithful to our holy hour. My founder, whose name is Venerable Bruno Lanteri, his patron saint is St. Bruno, he he tried to enter into the Carthusians, but his health did not permit it. But he brought part of that spirit into the formation and the foundation of the Oblates. So much so that he was known to have said that the Oblates should be Carthusians in the house and they should be apostles outside the house. Now you might say, what does that mean, Father Broom? Carthusians in the house and apostles outside the house. It means this, that we as oblates, by this Carthusian spirit, it means cultivating silence so that we can pray, so that we can read, so that we can study, so that we can write, so that we can prepare ourselves to become apostles, successful apostles, outside in the world. So as Fulton Sheen said, first come, then go. Come to be with Christ, then go out and bring Christ to others. That's the meaning of being a Carthusian in the house and then becoming an apostle outside the house. All right, we've been going through the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. I'd like to comment on one verse today. Today we have the chapter 3, 1 to 5. And St. Paul, is experiencing a lot of suffering because these Galatians have jumped ship. In other words, these Galatians have, they have heard his word that he preached, but then they've abandoned the practice of the faith. 
of following Christ. And St. Paul is very strong today. One of the verses I'd like to comment on in this passage today, he says, After beginning with the Spirit, after beginning with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? I'd like to comment upon that. After beginning with the Spirit, are you to end with the flesh? Now all of us in our Perseverance family, we have to be very honest uh, with ourselves in this, that hopefully right now that we're all trying to live really good lives. We're trying to be faithful to our prayer lives. We're trying to be faithful to our holy hour. We're attending Mass on Sundays, some of us even on a week, weekly basis, even some on a daily basis. We're praying our rosary on a daily basis. We're tuning in to perseverance almost every day. Maybe we're reading the lives of the saints. In other words, most of us, I hope, are really trying to live good, holy lives. But, we have to walk humbly in the presence of God. That's right. Walking humbly in the presence of God, meaning this, that all of us, myself included, we're all very weak. Jesus says, pray, keep awake, because the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. St. Paul will go on to say that the good I want to do, I end up by doing the exact opposite. St. Paul will also say, when we're standing, be careful lest we fall. St. Philip Neri, seeing a bum on the street, says, there go I, save the grace of God. St. Therese will go on to say, the most abominable, heinous things that any sinner has done, I could do them also. St. Francis, at the end of his life, said, I could still be a father of a thousand children. So, we have to uh, walk humbly before the face of God. Walk humbly before the face of God, that we're, because we're all weak. And St. Paul says that, after beginning with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so many things in vain? So these words of St. Paul are a real uh, warning for, for me and for you. That we could all fall. So we have to pray for the gift of, we want to pray for the gift of perseverance. And that's even the gospel for today. Let me give you an example. And the saints say the corruption of the best is the worst. Here's a question for you. A thousand years before Christ came, we have King David and his relatives. Who was the wisest man in the world shortly after King David died? Who was the wisest man in the world, but he ended up by being the biggest fool in the world? I ask you the question once again. Who is the who was the wisest man in the world who, who ended up be, becoming the biggest fool in the world? I'll give you a hint. David had several sons. Absalom. but also another son whose name was Solomon. Upon dying, Solomon was, was anointed and chosen to be the king following his father, King David. Solomon, the way he ordered the kingdom, its order, the buildings, the workers, 
was breathtaking. Even the king, of, the queen of Sheba traveled to see Solomon to sit at his feet and to listen to the words of wisdom that flowed from his mouth. And she was breathless by seeing the order and the method of the kingdom that was set up by Solomon. She was shocked. She had heard about it. She traveled from afar to meet King Solomon, bringing gifts. And when she came, it was even beyond what she expected. She was breathless. But what happened was King Solomon, he had a harem of women, many of which were not believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and David. These women, they worshiped false gods. And Solomon took them into his harem. So he had a whole harem of women, many of which, many of which were pagan or worshiping pagan gods and they insisted they insisted to Solomon to allow them to have built these foreign temples to foreign gods and Solomon capitulated to their to their whimsical desires so Solomon gave in to these women We'd have to say that the principal reason behind this was that of lust. So Solomon ends up his life. He was the wisest of the wise, and he ends up as the, the fool, the most foolish of the fools. I'd like to tell you a little story. Yesterday I was li listening to a a show on demand of Patrick Madrid in which a, a woman called in. Her name was Sarah. And she was well, she was almost in tears because she was married with her two little kids. And her husband had problems with this earlier, but he's given into it fully. And her husband is addicted to pornography. Addicted to pornography. So this woman asked uh, Patrick Madrid what to do because uh, it seemed as if he was not giving in. He's not work fighting against this. And Patrick Madrid pointed out that, you know, if he's, he's totally addicted to pornography and has no, he has no intention of giving it up, number one, no more marital intimacy between you and him because he's breaking his vows. And Patrick Madrid said something very strong. He said, L listen to this. Someone who's willfully addicted to pornography is, is, is introducing to his home a sanctuary to the devil. Wow. That's strong medicine, isn't it? I'd like to repeat that. Someone who willfully invites pornography into his home is establishing a sanctuary to the devil in his own home. So Patrick Madrid insisted upon this man overcoming this. And if it gets worse and worse and the children become exposed to this, then Patrick Madrid would say, okay, you have to leave the home. I'm saying that in conjunction to what I'm commenting upon in the reading of St. Paul. He says, you're beginning in the spirit, you're ending in the flesh. In Pope Francis, in his talks on Wednesday, the general audience, he's giving a series of thoughts on on discernment. 
He says we cannot have a discerning heart if we do not have a deep life of prayer. Pope Francis also said in these uh, last three weeks in the general audience that we have to arrive at self-knowledge. Self-knowledge, which is related to getting to know who we are, our good points as well as our weak points. I like to call it, I like to call it our, our kryptonite. I like to call it our kryptonite. When I give the spiritual exercises in my 10-week program, give the spiritual exercises in my 10-week program. I go through what are called the capital sins and their opposing virtues. What are the capital sins and what are the opposing virtues? This is a good way to get to know who we are. To get to know our interior clock, what makes us tick and what makes us not tick. This is a good way to arrive at this self-knowledge. This self-knowledge. In the capital sense, these bad tendencies we have within our hearts as a result of original sin, Thomas Aquinas would call it concupiscence or fomi peccati. would be gluttony and lust, avarice, sloth, those all related to our corporeal nature, envy, anger, and greed. There we have the seven capital sins. The opposing virtue, so I, th I think it'll become to terms knowing what is our weak point and what we have to do to practice the opposing virtue with the help of God's grace. We will not become the Solomon who is the wisest man in the world, ends up as the biggest fool. And as Paul says, you started in the spirit, you end in the flesh. The opposing virtue, the, the opposing virtue of gluttony would be that of temperance, of temperance. The opposing virtue of lust would be purity or chastity. The opposing virtue of avarice would be generosity. Aquinas would call it prodigality. The opposite virtue of sloth would be diligence. The opposing virtue of envy would be that of admiration as well as gratitude. The opposing virtue of anger would be meekness. The opposing virtue of pride would be that of humility. Jesus who is meek and humble of heart. Jesus who is meek and humble of heart. We have to be careful. We have to be very careful. Because we're, as St. Paul says, be careful when you're standing lest you fall. I mentioned earlier St. Philip Neri walking in the streets, saw a, a bum, a vagabond in the street, and he said, there go I, save the grace of God. 
Philip Mary also said, Lord, keep your hand upon me, lest people, that was his nickname, Philip, betray you. And once he became a priest, he said, keep both of your hands on me, lest I betray you. Once he was ordained a priest. How true. How the enemy wants to shoot for the kill priests and bishops who are the generals of the army. I think it's worthy of recounting this story. Maybe you've heard it before, but it's, a, it's one of the best stories I've ever heard. Related to what Paul says, you end in the, you start out in the spirit, but you end in the flesh. <clears throat> And I'd like to proceed this story by, by simply saying this. Now, you are following me. You're practicing Catholics. How many, how many relatives and friends? How many relatives and friends do you have that when you were a child, maybe you're a teenager, maybe even a young adult, that these people that you know practice their faith, and maybe they were even more fervent than, 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 than we were. Maybe they were even more fervent than we were. And now, they're no longer practicing their faith. They're, um, they've gone to maybe a, a religious sect. They're disgruntled and angry about the Catholic Church. They doubt the real presence. They're acrimonious and bitter against the priesthood. We all know them. We all know them. And maybe someone who's very close to us, maybe someone that's even living in the same home with us. There go I, said the grace of God. Why is it that your husband or uncle or our or relative or our cousin is wandering down that path and it's not us not because of any innate goodness on our part quite the contrary not because of any innate goodness on our part but because god is so good and we have to be eternally humble and grateful for the grace that god has given to us so here's the story it's one of my favorite stories that I like to tell in conjunction with uh, with the capital sins. And it's a story of a man who's taking a walk through the woods, a leisurely peaceful walk through the woods with his son, his 12-year-old son. And as they're walking, the father stops and looks very intently into the eyes of his son. And he says, son, I really believe that when the very depths of my heart there is a ravenous, voracious, angry, pitiless wolf within me seeking to devour. So after finishing, they start to walk. The son is thinking, my father has this ravenous wolf within him. What does that mean? What does that mean? So the wheels are turning and the son is trying to plumb the depths of what this means that his father has this ravenous, voracious wolf within him, ready to devour.
After walking for about 10 minutes, the father stops and looks intently into the eyes of the son, says, my son, I feel that within me there is a lamb, a gentle, loving, kind, peaceful, humble lamb that is within. Now they're walking now another 15, 20 minutes and the son is trying to make sense uh, of what his father has said to him. What does this mean? My father said that there's a ravenous wolf within him. In the same time, there was a gentle, loving, friendly lamb within him. Son is divided. He's not at peace. He wants to know what does this double story mean that his father has recounted him? What does it mean? What does it mean? So they're walking another 15 or 20 minutes. The, the son grabs onto the sleeve of the father and says, Dad, I can't take it anymore. What do you mean by this story? You have a wolf and you have a lamb within it, within you. The son says, Father, Dad, who's going to win? Is it going to be the wolf or the lamb? Who's going to win? Father stops, he peers deeply into the eyes of his son and says, Son, whichever one I feed most Whichever one I feed most. Which one are we feeding most? Which one are we feeding most? Are we feeding most? The wolf or the lamb? The wolf, gluttony, lust, avarice, sloth, envy, anger, pride. That is the wolf that we have within us. The wolf that we have within us as a result of original sin. The wolf that we have within us is a result of original sin. What about the lamb? Temperance. Chastity. Diligence. Generosity. Gratitude, admiration, meekness, and humility. Who's going to win? Who's going to win within you and within me? Who's going to win? It all depends upon one thing. Which of those two animals are we going to be feeding most? Is it going to be the wolf? Or is it going to be or is it going to be the wolf or is it going to be the lamb? Who is going to win? We have to be humble. And recognize as Philip Neri says, there go I save the grace of God. 
I've often wondered, you know, why, why am I here? I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic, I'm a religious, I'm a priest for many years. I'm in an oblate community in Southern California. <clears throat> why, why is it that I'm, I am here as a practicing priest and religious? Why am I and not others? I don't know. The only thing I can say is, thanks be to God and pray on a daily basis for perseverance. Give me an example. When I, I was brought up and raised, I would go to um, to Detroit, Michigan from New York and New Jersey to visit my relatives because they all came from almost 90% of my relatives uh, lived in the Detroit area, and my dad was about the only one that moved out, out of state. One of my cousins, a couple years older than me, we'd always go to Mass on Sunday. He eventually would leave the Catholic faith, get involved in transcendental meditation. Today that would be the New Age movement and become one of the chief leaders in the Midwest in the tran in the the TM it's called TM or Transcendental Meditation. And I think even to this day, he's probably about seventy now, about that, maybe late sixties. And his mother his mother died about a year ago, my, which is my mom's older sister in her early nineties. Why is it that this Why is it that this individual no longer practices the faith and is a chief teacher in the transcendental meditation, which is really, it's a false religion, and why am I a practicing Catholic priest? It's a mystery. I could have gone down that route. I even remember, and this is a, sad to say, that when I entered into Villanova, there was actually a Transcendental Meditation group inviting us to go to be with them, sad to say. Talk about the cockle and the wheat, uh, and the wheat or the weeds and the wheat. How many of us are exposed to many dangers out there? It's almost as if, my friends, we're walking in our spiritual life, we're walking like through a, a landmine where there's a field with a lot of underneath bombs, these mines, which are bombs. And then we have to walk meandering in between these landmines, these bombs, so that we will not step on them and to be smashed to smithereens. I think it's a good idea to pray for the grace to walk hand in hand with Jesus and Mary, with St. Joseph leading the way, and behind us our guardian angel, every step along the way. Every step along the way, hand in hand with Jesus and Mary, St. Joseph leading the way, and our guardian angel behind us. But my friends, if you, you and Perseverance Family Conversation, I want to encourage us not, not to give, not to give in to um, discouragement. But what Saint Paul says, he's saying to you and to me. After beginning with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? After beginning the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? See our spiritual life. Saint Ignatius speaks about spiritual exercises. St. Paul says, I fought the good fought, fought, I ran the good race. St. Paul was brought up and raised in the context of the Olympic Games, the Greek Olympic Games. Therefore, St. Paul you, you says, I fought the, fought the good fight, I, I, I ran the good race. 
using these images of uh, the sports and the Olympic Games that he was exposed to. We have to pray for the gift. The gift of perseverance. That we would persevere to the end. I've often mentioned this in the past and haven't mentioned it for a good year, I don't think. But that movie, which is based on reality, of Chariots of Fire is very good. Chariots of Fire is a story about these runners from Scotland as well as England arriving at the Olympic Games in the early 1900s in France. The major protagonist in this is Eric Little, who is the fleetest of foot of Scotland, would eventually become a Protestant minister going to China and dying of brain cancer when he's relatively young, preaching the word of God to the Chinese. But there's one scene in this movie of Chariots of Fire I'd like just to recount to you. And maybe this scene can, maybe this scene can be part of our lives. Related to this topic, starting in the flesh, starting in the spirit, ending in the flesh. We want to start in the spirit, we want to end in the spirit. So this is before arriving at the Olympic Games. Before arriving at the Olympic Games. Eric Little is running the 400. Just so you're aware, if you're not too familiar with uh, track and field, the 400 would be one lap around. Four laps would be a mile. So one lap would be a quarter of a mile. That's what it would be. So there he is on the track racing against three other racers, runners. Ready, set, go, boom! So the four of them take off. In the first couple of seconds, they're running side by side. Then all of a sudden, Eric Little, who was running on the very edge of the track, He's running side by side by one of the opponents, and you can see that done discreetly, but it's done. His opponent gives him an elbow. And if you're running full force and you're given an elbow, that will knock the wind out of your sails. You will lose balance. And that's exactly what happened to him. He cascades to the ground. Thereby losing a few seconds. Now you might say, well, big deal. It is a big deal. If you're running 10 miles, it's not so much a big deal. But if you're running the, if you're running the 440, you're running a quarter of a mile, which is really a sprint. Losing three to four seconds could be, could be critical. So he had, he had two options. To stay down and bemoan his, his fate. Or he could get up and try to win the race. Guess what he did? He made the heroic decision to get up and to try to catch up to the other three. He's way behind them now. So he gets up. And he puts, he puts it on full gear.
He passes one. He eventually gets up and passes a second one. And he's arriving almost at the finish line, running to catch up to the man that actually elbowed him and knocked him down. He puts it on full gear and he passes that man that knocked him down and beat him possibly by a split second. He falls to the ground and he's panting. <gasps> and one of the best trainers in the world, his name was Sam, saw this. They helped him up and he said, this was not the prettiest of all the races I've ever, ever, ever seen, but it is the most valiant, the most courageous of all the races I've ever seen. My friends, related to our topic today, maybe we have fallen down. Maybe we've fallen down, but let's do a nunc chepi. Let's do a nunc chepi. Let's get up. And as Junipero Serra says, siempre adelante, siempre adelante, nunca atrás. Nunc chepi. Let's get up. And run the good race. Fight the good fight so as to receive the merited prize of eternal life that God has prepared for you and for me. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.